God hasn't told us everything that's going to take place. He has given us the big picture prophetically. In fact, I want to have you leave tonight with one thing. Prophecy is as easy as three, two, one. We usually say one, two, three, but I'm doing it in reverse order. It's as easy as three, two, one. Our preview of coming attractions is a reminder of how easy prophecy is if you keep that big picture. Uh, So tonight, what I want to do is first look at three key prophetic signposts. Uh, just uh, three pieces that help us remind, uh, remind us where the world's going. And then I want us to see two key relational failures that mark the period just before Christ says he's coming back to earth. And then finally, I want to end by zeroing in on the one key to-do item that God wants us to focus on as we wait for him to come. Three key signposts, two key relational failures, and one key to-do item. And you go, and you're going to do that in 30 minutes, right? Yes, I am. Because I talk fast. (laughs) Well, let me start then with the three key signposts. What are the three key signposts that I have in mind? Well, the first is Israel. And you got to start there. They're the center of God's prophetic bullseye. You can't understand God's program for the future without understanding his plan for Israel. You, You can't understand the Old Testament. You can't understand the Gospels. You can't understand the book of Revelation without understanding God's program for the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God announced, uh, I mean, give so many examples. Uh, Isaiah 9, God has announced a son from the line of David was going to be born. He's going to reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. Well, the son was born, but the reigning on David's throne hasn't yet happened, but it will. Uh, Daniel 9, God gives a timetable for the working out of the Messiah. He first announces the length of time from the going forth of a command to restore and build Jerusalem until the coming of the Messiah, uh, the prince. And uh, the clock began ticking on that uh, prophetic timetable when a Persian king gave a command to Nehemiah to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That prophecy was fulfilled to the very day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt, the foal of a donkey, just like Zechariah said the Messiah would show up on the day Daniel said the Messiah would show up. But Daniel was then told there's a gap. That Messiah, the anointed one, is going to be cut off. He's going to be killed. The city that was built, the temple that was built, will be be destroyed, and there's going to be a time of trouble for the Jewish people. But the final part of that prophecy, the final seven years of that prophecy, haven't yet been fulfilled. And God splits that seven-year period into uh, three and a half years. Uh, Right in the middle of it, he says there's going to be something called an abomination that causes desolation. It'll be set up in a temple, and that's going to create a a three-and-a-half-year time of terrible trouble and turmoil for the Jewish people that will end when the Messiah returns. Now, it's no accident. Jesus comes along, and I'm, I, I'm glad to hear that Michael is speaking on Matthew 24 because I'm going I'm to mention a few things, but I'm not going to step on all he's going to say. So this is just a preview of his preview of coming attractions. <laughs> but Jesus talks about all the events that are leading up to his future. It's his statement on the future. And in the middle of it all, he stops and says, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Jesus is quoting Daniel chapter 9, telling you you better pay attention. And then Matthew adds a comment, uh, let the reader understand. I don't think Jesus said that. That's the part Matthew added in. So G- Matthew said, you better listen to what Jesus is saying and pay attention to it. Uh, what's going to happen? He says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Here comes the time of trouble for the Jewish people. But that final three and a half year period of the tribulation doesn't end until the Messiah comes. It's Zechariah who tells us how it's going to end. His feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives, which is going to split in two. You've got to go to Israel, by the way. It's God's will for you to go to Israel, if for no other reason that you can have a before and after view of the Mount of Olives. Uh, right now, it's just one mountain. But someday, people are going to say, well, there's two mountains. You can say, yeah, you didn't see it when I did. Uh, it's it's a, a before and after. You're going to, it's going to split in two. And Zechariah also says, they're going to look on, me, look on him whom they've pierced and mourn as one mourns for an only son. We know who that is. But that period ends with the return of Jesus. I just give those as examples to say over and over again, if you want to understand the Old Testament or the Gospels or the book of Revelation, you've got to put Israel right in the center of it all because that's the place that God is going to focus his attention leading up to the return of his son. Now, since 1948, Israel has been back to the land. It's been 75 years. They just celebrated their 75th anniversary. But God's stopwatch for that final seven-year period, he's holding it, but he hasn't clicked it yet. When he removes the church from the earth, that's when that seven-year timetable is going to begin counting down. So, you want to know the future? 
keep your eye on Israel. Now that leads to the second of the signposts. And I, I'm going to lump them together here. Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Uh, it's really Ezekiel 38 and 39, the battle of Gog and Magog. Uh, I list it as a signpost, but it's interesting. This, this battle is actually just a, a one-time event. It's a one and done in the Bible. And as much as these nations think they're really important, in God's eyes, they're just going to fulfill one purpose, and then they're gone. Uh, Ezekiel starts by stating very clearly in Ezekiel 38 and 39, he says, in fact, after many days, you'll be called to arms. In future years, you'll invade a land that's recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which has long been desolate. This battle, he puts it in a time frame, after many days, in future years, when the nation of Israel, which has been scattered around the world, is brought back to the land. Hmm. From the day he wrote that till today, the battle hasn't happened, but the pieces are coming together. Uh, that's what's still future. Now, Ezekiel describes the nations involved in the attack. Uh, and though um, the name sounds strange, you read that passage, and your eyes start glazing over, going in the back of your head, you know, Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Togarma. Whoa! But they were real places in his day. If you could have pulled out an actual map in his day, you would have found those places, and you can find where they are in a modern map today. Uh, the leaders from the land, his name's Gog, from the land of Magog, which was north of the Black Sea. And that kind of gives a general idea where it is. He's said to be from the far north in Ezekiel's passage, and he's said to rule over some other areas, including Meshach and Tubal, which were regions north of the Black and Caspian Sea. That region up in the north is where this guy's from. Now, this future leader has some allies. One is named Persia. Persia is what we would call today Iran. Another one is uh, named there is Togarma, which was the area of the uh, Turkish peninsula today, the, uh, in, uh, the, uh, the uh, Near East, if we would say it. But what's today modern Turkey is the area where Togarma was. So someone from the very far north has the Iranians, the Persians, the people from uh, Togarma, which is where Turkey is, and he's going to launch an attack. Now, those nations uh, make up Russia and Iran and Turkey, and then there's some other smaller allies, one of which is uh, Libya, and one's another one south of, of Egypt that's mentioned there. And it pictures them all coming together, being led by that leader from the north, uh, coming to, joining forces to attack Israel. So if you want to keep your eyes on the future, I always say, watch the growing relationship between Russia and Iran and Turkey. It's up again, it's down again, but it is amazing how the trajectory is moving in a certain direction. And that is that they each need one another, and they're looking for a way to uh, change the course of human history, change the course of the Middle East, and I think they're going to see that Israel is the key to that. That's why they're going to try and launch an attack at some point. But the key you need to know from the Bible, God's the one pulling the strings. God tells you about it thousands of years ago so that you can be aware that this is going to happen at some point when God suddenly attacks, it's all part of his plan. He's going to bring destruction on them to show Israel and the world that he's really in control. So Israel, the center of it all. But Russia, Iran, and Turkey, there's going to be a battle that is going to be used to catalyze through Israel and then the world uh, to recognize God is, is playing a new role in the world. But the third one of these is Europe. And I have I call it the rise of the revived Roman Empire. Well, in Daniel 2, Daniel predicted the rise of four Gentile powers that would control the land of Israel until the Messiah would show up. Now, he pictures them there as a, a statue that has a, a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, and then uh, feet of iron and clay. And uh, a rock then comes out of the, the sky to destroy the statue and set up the kingdom. And that refers to the Messiah who's going to arrive, smash it all to pieces, and set up his mountain that grows to fill the earth, the kingdom that's going to control the world. Now, the different parts of the statue predicted the rise of, and I have it on here, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Well, how do we know that? Well, we know it a couple ways. One, he gives us the first one. He's, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. He was ruling Babylon. And then he says, and after you, another kingdom will arise. Not another king, but another kingdom. Well, Medo-Persia followed, uh, followed Babylon. And then a third kingdom will come along, uh, named Greece. Uh, it's interesting, in Daniel chapter 8, uh, Medo-Persia and Greece are named by name, lest we have a doubt. God says, I'll tell you the kingdoms that are going to come on this earth. Now, Daniel in chapter 7 describes the same four empires, but he pictures them as animals this time. And the first one he gives is Babylon. In fact, it's a lion with eagle's wings. 
the perfect picture of Babylon. Uh, Babylon, and I've, I've been there. I've gotten to walk on the streets of Babylon. I babble on about Babylon whenever I get a chance. But the, uh, the walls on the streets and the walls in the palace had glazed reliefs of lions. Uh, when Daniel was uh, still living in Babylon, even though the next empire had come, he was thrown into a lion's den. I mean, they, they kept lions as, uh, they, we call it a zoo, except it was more of a, a torture chamber. Uh, but they kept those lions there. Babylon was connected with lions. And so ba- uh, God comes along and says, let me picture a lion with eagle's wings, you know, kind of majestic, except the wings are going to get plucked off, which is exactly what God did to the first king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. He humbled him. And God did it to the last king of Babylon, Belshazzar, and humbled him. Uh, a perfect picture of Babylon. But the second em- empire he pictures in Daniel 7 is, is uh, Medo-Persia. But he pictures it like a bear, but if I can picture up here, it's raised up on one side. It's like a bear on this side is doing all the exercises and this side's not. So it's a real powerful bear on one side, stronger than the other. That's the perfect picture of Medo-Persia. It was actually two empires, or I, I used to say it, two, two, two empires in one. <laughs> but the Medo-Persians, the Persians were the dominant ones. They were the stronger of the two as these empires joined together. Two empires together, but with one, Persia being dominant. But it has three ribs in its teeth. Why three ribs? Well, the Persians actually conquered three empires. They conquered Babylon, and they conquered the empire of Lydda, and they conquered the empire of Egypt. So he pictures uh, the second empire again, but now it's as a bear, but it's the same picture. He comes to the third empire, and he pictures it like a leopard with four wings and four heads. And this represents the speedy conquest of Alexander the Great, the first of the Greek uh, rulers, uh, who took over uh, the whole world in a very short period of time. But right when he was at the height of his power, he dies, and his empire was divided among four of his generals. Four heads, four wings, fitting with the rapid-moving leopard Greek empire. And that leads to the fourth empire. And uh, this is the closest I can get to what it looks like. And I didn't draw that, because if I did, it would be a stick figure up there. Uh, but it's, uh, it's picturing, a, a, as Daniel describes, a frightening beast with iron teeth and then has horns. And it represents the Roman Empire, which was ruling over the promised land when Jesus came. In fact, I love, I, if you ever read Josephus, he's fun to read. Sometimes it's hard to read the old translation, but uh, Josephus is fun to read because he describes these empires. By the way, he saw Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece being the first three. And then he says, it comes to the fourth, which was Rome. He's writing to the Romans. How do you write to them and say, God's going to destroy you? Uh, he, he talks about them being this ep- major empire. And then he says, Daniel also did declare the meaning of the fourth empire, but I think it not proper to relate it here, since my rule is only to describe things past or present, but not things future. He punted, but he saw Rome being the fourth empire. It was actually clear to him. Uh, so it's a frightening beast. Uh, they were ruling the promised land when Jesus came the first time. But he didn't destroy the Roman Empire at the first coming. And yet in Matthew 24, as he comes along and pictures his connection to Daniel again, Jesus is coming back. And there's coming a time when that stone is going to smash the statue. When one like the Son of Man is going to go to the Ancient of Days to get that kingdom and come back to earth and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he's still coming. John in Revelation 13 describes additional information about that fourth empire, and he connects it perfectly with Daniel chapter 7. It's the last three and a half years. In fact, Keep following three and a half years. Uh, Daniel, Daniel and Revelation both describe it as a time, times, and half a time. Three and a half of something. It's also described as 42 months. It's also described as 1,260 days, which happens to be 42 30-day months. Hmm. It's as though God keeps wanting to let us know how long is that time before the Messiah comes when he's going to be really causing a problem for Israel until the Messiah comes to destroy that empire? Three and a half years, the last three and a half years of that seven-year time frame. All the details are there. But the thing you're watching for here is the, uh, three, uh, the four empires. Remember, the three key points, Israel's the center, Gog and Magog's coming, and watch for a revived Roman Empire, something coming out of what was the Roman Empire. It's going to be here to play that final act before Jesus comes to earth. Now, our question, where's the U.S. in all of this? We're not there. Uh, and you have to ask the question, why? And the answer is, we're not told. So anything we say is speculation. But it's possible that when the rapture happens, the U.S. becomes a second-rate power overnight. Uh, stop and think of all the salt and light that the, that the uh, Christians have been in this country 
Watch it all disappear and see how rapidly our country goes down. It's possible we could be destroyed as a nation in the first half of the tribulation. Remember, uh, a quarter of the world's population is going to be destroyed, and then later a third of the world's population. That's half the world's population. And without the Christians here, there's no guarantee that the U.S. is going to survive. It's also possible that we just become a second-rate follower nation, and we're one of the rest of the world that throws its hat behind the Antichrist. But for whatever reason, the power is going to shift back toward Europe, back toward the revived Roman Empire, and the U.S. is not going to play the dominant role that it's played. Uh, let's pray that we continue playing the role we have right now, as long as we're here. Uh, but in God's, in God's plan, it's going to change at some point. Okay, I'll get back to the thing. I want to talk about the second point. Two key relational failures. Three key uh, things to watch for, and then two key relational failures. And the first of these is going to be Matthew chapter 24. And again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to steal Michael's thunder here. Uh, but I want to look at the key failures that uh, God says are going to describe the time just before Christ comes back. The first of these failures is in Matthew 24, but I'm going to look at Matthew 24 in a way that's different than certainly Michael's going to look at it and uh, than most people look at it. Uh, because I only want to focus on one particular thing. Uh, in that Olivet Discourse where Jesus tells what's going to happen before he comes to, uh, returns to earth, he shares a number of specific events that he says are going to uh, precede that return, and he's going to focus on uh, a series of conflicts and struggles. Uh, first of these is internationally. Uh, Jesus says it this way. He says, uh, nations are going to rise against nations. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. Uh, the kingdoms are going to be fighting against kingdoms. He pictures the uh, end time beginning as a time of struggle uh, on an international scale. Now, as the world begins to devolve, as it gets further into chaos and conflict, uh, the international scene is going to become even more fractured than it is today. You know, we've seen Russia invade Ukraine. Uh, we've seen the infighting in Sudan. Uh, we've watched the threats of war from China in the Far East. Uh, we're seeing North Korea trying to threaten the U.S. with nuclear weapons. All of that is just the beginning. It's going to become worse. There's going to be international struggle as nations try and rise up and take advantage of the chaos at the beginning of the tribulation period, take over from others. Uh, but Jesus goes on to say uh, the, the conflict and struggle isn't just international, it's going to be interpersonal. Uh, he says uh, uh, followers during that time, and there will be people coming to faith during that period, but they're going to be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Anyone during that period who dares to stand up and follow Jesus is going to be persecuted. There's going to be an interpersonal conflict against them. Uh, one of the things I used to love teaching, I, I had to, you remember the old candid camera? I mean, not, some of you weren't even around. You weren't even born yet when that went off the air. But it was a great show to look at psychology behind things. And one of them happens to be when people walked on an elevator, they had a candid camera person uh, hidden away, and they had all the candid camera staff. And so one, one un unsuspecting individual would come up to the elevator, and as he stepped on, everybody else would step on. Well, when you get on an elevator, you walk back, and then you turn, and you always face the doors. So they said, what would happen if everybody who got on except that one unsuspecting person faced the other way? And then they showed, the, they would have the doors closed, and then they'd have the doors open again to see what was happening. And uh, everyone kept turning the other direction. And then they thought, how far can we push this? And so for the last individual, they would have everybody in the elevator, and on, on cue, they would all turn like this. And they turned turn like this. And this is back when they wore hats. They'd take their hats off. They'd put them on. And you know what happened to that one person? The peer pressure got to them. And it was just forcing them to, to con, uh, conform to the group. Well, can you imagine what it's going to be like during the tribulation period with all of the pressure that's going to be on people? There's going to be incredible in, interpersonal conflict. Uh, and, be, and Jesus says, because of it, and because of that wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. As he pictures it individually, not just many, the love of most is going to grow cold. Now, again, we are not going through the tribulation. Here's where I got to stop. Listen to this carefully. This is very important. Jesus is not talking about us. We go up in the rapture. If you follow on Jesus, you're gone. But there are going to be people coming to faith during that time. We know there's going to be 144,000 Jews for Jesus witnessing, and then, and then that's in Revelation 7. The last half of the chapter talks about an un, un, uncountable number from around the world of every people, tribe, boat, nation, language who come to faith through them. But those individuals are going to be tested. They're going to be pressured. They're going to be put to death for their faith. And there's going to be incredible conflict and struggle against them individually. And that's why Jesus said some, and there are people today who say, oh, I love Jesus, I'm a Christian. They're probably not personally. They don't know Jesus personally, but they say they're a Christian. But when this time comes, you know how many of them are going to turn 
and go the other direction, he says the love of most will grow cold. Uh, when the pressure becomes great, uh, they're going to disappear. Now, there's a good application, I think, in that for us. That time's still future, but uh, the principle for us is when the, when the troubles come, let's make sure we're going to stand true to Jesus. Uh, and if you think it's tough now, it's going to get worse in our country. Uh, and after the rapture, it gets even infinitely worse. But if we have trouble staying true to Jesus today, imagine what it will be like back then. That's the key relational failure. Now, there's a second key relational failure. Uh, it's 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I, I was trying to figure out what to call it. I finally call, decided I'll call it the rise of the selfie generation. Uh, it's found in Paul's final letter to Timothy. And uh, I see Paul describing this selfie generation, if you will. In, in the first four verses, Paul lists 19 characteristics of a generation that are going to be around during what he specifically says are the last days. Recognize this, in the last days, he says, terrible times shall come. And then he begins describing what it'll be like. It'll be uh, these perilous or terrible times. And he starts, and in fact, I'll pick it this way, with the 19 characteristics, uh, with the selfie photo. But then he says, uh, and, and here's going to be the list. I'm going to put all 19 up. Sorry that it's small, but you'll follow along. He begins and ends by saying there's going to be misplaced love. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, and he ends with the list with lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, if you look at those three characteristics, lovers of themselves, that's narcissism. I'm the one. I'm so great. Lovers of money, materialism. And lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, this is going to be described by hedonism. That's what's going to drive them most. Uh, in the last days, people won't love God. Uh, they won't love their neighbor as themselves, uh, the, the commands Jesus gave and the, and the Mosaic law gave. Uh, they're going to focus on loving themselves and pleasing themselves. Uh, he then comes to the next generations, uh, the next characteristics that uh, he gives. And the list, actually, there's three together that focus on characteristics related to pride. He says they'll be boastful, proud, and abusive. Uh, boastful, that's prideful words. A proud, that's the attitude behind that haughty attitude. I'm, I'm pretty good. In fact, I'm better than you are. And they'll become abusive, which literally that word is blasphemous. Uh, the, the word has the idea of reviling or irreverent, insulting language. Uh, their speech is going to reflect their, their prideful attitude. I'm going to build myself up by tearing anybody else down because nobody's as good as I am. Uh, Paul moves on beyond that. And the next thing he does is he has eight characteristics. Uh, in the middle of it, he, I call them the, the eight uncharacteristics. Do you remember when, when 7 Ups uh, tried to have a, uh, an advertising campaign as the Uncola? Uh, well, Paul is going to use the uncharacteristics here. That is, he's going to list a characteristic, and then he puts a Greek alpha privative, that's a fancy word, uh, so he puts an A in front of it that means not. Now, where have we ever heard of that before? Like, say, millennium. Is there a millennial? And I wanted to make that mean something the opposite. I put an A in front of it, and I have a millennial. Uh, in Greek, that's, that, if you do that, they put an alpha in front of something, and it means it's the opposite of what the word is. Uh, we do it in English a lot more using un. So you can be helpful or you can be unhelpful. You can be cheerful or uncheerful. You can be happy or unhappy. Uh, we do that, well, Paul uses eight of them almost in, in a row. Well, there's one gap in there, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. But he has these eight characteristics, and he's going to say, this is what it'll look like during the end times. Now, the first phase, he says, is going to be uh, matched by disobedience to parents. If, if I could change that to that uncharacteristic, he says, it's going to be a time when people are going to be unobedient. We'd say disobedient, but that, that, well, you understand. It. He changes obedience to the opposite. Now, you think about it, in our idea, that the God-given authority that we have today, the way God has society structured, it begins with uh, children obeying parents. But if children don't obey their parents... Those same children then growing up to be the ones who aren't going to obey their teachers, just try and make me do that. Uh, they're certainly not going to obey the government. And they're not going to be the, obey the police. They're not going to obey, obey anyone else. They're going to be disobedient. It starts with the, the most basic of it all, parents, and moves on. But you're going to have a group that don't care, and they're not going to follow what anybody tells them to do. And next, Paul says, they're going to be ungrateful. Uh, they'll lack that basic sense of, of thanks, thankfulness of being thankful for what people do, it's replaced by a sense of entitledness. You know, I, don't do, I don't need to be grateful because I deserve this. Uh, and we're on our way to producing that now, sadly, uh, an entire ungrateful generation. 
Uh, the third in these uns is unholy. Now, we can translate that as not pious or not pure. Uh, it's, it's the idea that uh, you want me to be like God, you want me to be like Christ, forget it. I could care less. That is not where I'm going. Uh, the fourth is unloving. It's interesting. It's the only time this word is used in, in the whole New Testament, and it actually comes from a Greek word for love, not the normal ones we think of. This one, this one has the idea of familial love. It, it's the love of parents that they would normally have for their children or the love children would normally have for parents. And Paul says they're not going to have that characteristic. It, it's the idea of someone who's so heartless, uh, it's a person who could kill their own children or kill their own parents just to get what they want. And Paul says that's going to be the characteristic. And then they're going to be unforgiving. Uh, in our Bibles, it's, it's uh, often translated like irreconcilable. But I like the idea of unforgiving because the idea is it's a person who, if you slight me, you, you, you cause me a problem, I'm going to hold that grudge and I'm going to hold it for the rest of my life. I will never forgive you for what you did. Uh, and Paul says that's going to be the characteristic in the last days. Now, there's a gap right there. Uh, and I'll come back to that characteristic he puts in in just a second. But uh, let me finish the last three of these uns that he has. Uh, number six in Paul's list, he says, uh, without self-control, uh, literally it says, without strength or, or uh, unstrong. And you go, I, I don't get that. But here's what he means. It's somebody who, who's unable to control their own emotions. Uh, it'd be someone who says, I couldn't help myself. I couldn't control myself. I just had to do it. And uh, they run off to, them, to themselves. Uh, number seven on that eight list is brutal. Uh, that's, the idea is ungentle, but that, that doesn't, doesn't nearly cover it. Brutal is a better description of it. Uh, the idea is someone who's just brutal. They're untamed. They're wild. Uh, they're savage. It's the way they talk. It's the way they treat other people. They're more like beasts than they really are about someone who's kind and gentle. And the final of these uns is not lovers of the good or unloving of good. And the best way to picture this, that would be someone who just despises and opposes anything that's right and decent. Uh, if you say this is what we ought to do, this is the good thing to do, they would just react viscerally to that in their lives. Uh, now, in using all those pictures and descriptions Paul has, he's basically saying that the last days are going to be characterized by people who don't possess any of the qualities we would associate with normal civilized behavior. And in the last days, humanity is going to devolve to about the level of savage beasts. Now, I left one out. And the one I left out, I put on there, there. slanderous is how it's translated usually. Uh, and um, it doesn't begin with that negative prefix. That's why I'm using it at last. But the Greek word that's used here, though it says slanderous, is diaboloi. And you think, that ah, sounds like a word I've heard before. Uh, another way to translate it might be devil-like or devilish. Uh, the devil really is the great slanderer. And that's the idea of the word here. It's the idea of someone wanting that desire just to hurt someone, to slander them, uh, to uh, cause them difficulty. And I think Paul puts it right almost in the middle of all this because he wants his listeners to know that in the last days, humanity is going to look more like Satan than like Christ. They're going to be more like the devil than like what God has established as what's good and right. Now, Paul then heads to the very final characteristic of it all. And he says, they're going to be treacherous, the last three, treacherous, rash, and conceited. Uh, they're going to be treacherous. They'll betray and stab their friends in the back if it's to their advantage. They'll be rash or, or reckless is the idea. It literally means they're going to be falling forward. It's like they're rushing in to do something uh, so fast that they're ready to stumble over themselves to get there. Uh, their rash actions, they're going to do something without even thinking it through. Uh, and uh, finally, he says, they're going to be conceited. And it comes from a word that originally had the idea of wrapped in smoke. Uh, it actually had the idea of, of being in the clouds, uh, being conceited to the point of almost insanity. And we'd probably say something like Napoleon complex. They think a lot more of themselves than they ought to think, uh, would be how my, my mom and dad would have described it to me. Uh, but they're going to they're gonna think pretty much of themselves that, to the point where uh, they, they don't truly understand even how, how much of a problem they are. Now, that list of last day characteristics is frightening because we see all those elements already starting to characterize our own society. Now, we might not be there yet, but uh, it looks like we're getting closer. And 2,000 years ago, God told us that's what society is going to look like in the last days. But he told us that in advance to remind us he's in control. 
It didn't just happen. God said, that's where it's all going to go to set up the last days. Now, all that, we looked at three, we looked at two, we looked at one, and that's where I want to get next. Uh, I want to end on a positive note, and that's the what, what's our one key to-do item. You know, uh, when you read all this stuff that may want to say, I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go buy a cabin really out far in the woods. I'm going to stop, stock up on beef jerky and bullets. Uh, but that's not what God wants us to do. God has one key to-do item for us. And you can look around at everything around us. You can look at these, these passages. You can become terribly discouraged or afraid or frightened. But God wants you to remember he's in control. That's why he tells us enough about the future to remind us it's all working out to his plan that results in Jesus returning to earth. And that's why he shared it. He wants you to have trust. He wants you to have confidence. He wants you to have hope. So that's his message for you. As he's working out everything prophetically, he says, but I have one thing for you to do. And we can see it in Acts 1.8, which also we talked about just briefly a little bit earlier. And so this by repetition and review. Uh, the disciples, uh, when Jesus had risen from the dead, they finally dawned on them. They had missed the, the, the boat. They, they had gotten it all wrong. Uh, they thought he was coming the first time to set up his kingdom. And then he died. And they said, well, that didn't turn out the way we thought. But now that he's risen from the dead, they get it, they think. And so they get one of their times with him during his time remaining on earth before he ascends to heaven. Uh, they finally said to him, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, I'll, I'll, here's the dire translation. Yeah, we didn't quite get all those details right before, but we, we think we have it now. That is, you're going to fulfill all those predictions that given in the prophets and restore the kingdom right now to Israel, right? Well, now Jesus could have said to them, yep, you got it right. Yep, we're, we're going to start the kingdom right now. He didn't, and it didn't start. He could have said, oh, you got it all wrong. It's a spiritual kingdom in your heart. That's going to be the tribulation and the millennium all together at once until the end of the age. He didn't. What did he say? It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. Uh, you're focusing on the wrong thing, disciples. God has it all taken care of. That's not your job, that's his. But you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I got a plan for you. The program's still in place. It's still coming. It's on target. But the exact timing and all those other details, they're not your job. God's got that all worked out. But I do have a job for you. And your one key to-do item is to share the good news. Now, the focus is on the need for them right then to be his witnesses, to start right where they were, right in Jerusalem, and to take that message out to ultimately the ends of the earth. And by the way, Peter got with the program. The very next chapter, Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches to the crowd on the day of Pentecost. And he tells them Jesus is both Lord, and by that he means God, and Christ, which is the Greek word for Mashiach, for the Messiah. Uh, so he's, he got the, who Jesus was, and he tells the crowd. And uh, In fact, then one chapter later, in Acts 3, he does it again to another crowd. In fact, he tells them there, they need to repent and turn to God, quote, so that your sins may be wiped out. And so, as he puts it then, times of refreshing may come from the Lord, that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Peter got it. The kingdom's still coming. Jesus is coming back to earth. The kingdom's going to be set up. But in the meantime, you need to turn to God. And so don't miss what he's saying there. That program is all still on target. The key right now is the thing that we need to recognize, that Jesus came the first time to die to pay for our sins. And the most important thing Peter tells his audience and God tells us that we need to do is to turn to him to have our sins wiped out. So Peter understood God's program. He understood it was still in place. In fact, he expected it to begin at any time. But in the meantime, his job was to witness for Christ and call on others to come to him as their Savior. Uh, Paul, by the way, did something very similar. I had 2 uh, Timothy 3 as the list of last day characteristics. But do you ever watch carefully what Paul does in that passage before and after? Uh, he emphasized something for Timothy that's very important. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2.15, just before that characteristic, Paul wrote, Do your best to present yourself to, God, yourself to God as one approved, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. Timothy, that's what's going to look like then. What do you need to do? You need to know the book. You need to understand that book. Uh, just after, he gives that list of characteristics. 
In, check, in chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, what does Paul write? All Scripture is God-breathed, and it's profitable for teaching, correcting, rebuking, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Timothy, where do you need to focus on? The book, so that you understand and you're equipped to do what God wants you to do. And then one chapter later, in chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, Paul comes to the final conclusion of all this, and he says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who's to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach, and by that the word means proclaim the word. Be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. In light of the coming last days, in light of the characteristics that are going to take place, in light of the certainty of Christ's return, what does God want Timothy to do? What does God have Paul tell Timothy he needs to do? He needs to study God's word. He needs to handle it correctly, and he needs to proclaim it fearlessly. And so do we. Now, this isn't a time to be afraid. Uh, it's not a time to be discouraged. It's not a time to be timid. It's not a time to be disengaged either. It's a time to get our priorities straight. Uh, it's a time to focus on God's word, to understand with crystal clarity exactly what God wants us to be doing in the time we have remaining. And we don't know how long that is. He's told us enough about the future to let us know that he's still in control, that his plan is still in place, and that he's working everything out toward the return of his son. Uh, he's going to be victorious in the end. We can leave all of that to God. Our role is to study his word and to be his witnesses. And that brings me all the way back down to where we started here, I think, and why we're here to tonight. Uh, for over 135 years, life in Messiah has been sharing God's heart for the Jewish people. Uh, they exist to share the good news of Jesus the Messiah, to help Jewish and Gentile believers mature in their faith, uh, to equip the church to share the gospel and stand against anti-Semitism, and to develop a deeper appreciation for the Jewish roots of our faith. And tonight is the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, as we've heard earlier. The, the Feast of Trumpets, it's the start of the days of awe, uh, but the, 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 the spring feasts all look toward Christ's first coming. The fall feasts point toward his second coming. And I think it's really appropriate that tonight we're starting this prophecy conference at the beginning of the feast that point towards Christ's second coming. We don't know how much longer we're going to have until God sounds his trumpet for us to take us home to be with him in heaven. But in the meantime, we do know what God wants us to be doing for him while we're waiting for that summons. We're to proclaim his word. We're to present the message of salvation through his son. And that's exactly what life and Messiah has been doing. And by God's grace, what they're going to continue to do uh, for the days ahead and the time that God gives them. Now, the book of Revelation ends, one of my favorite parts. Uh, Jesus turns to John at the very end and says, Behold, I come quickly. He's really saying, it, it, my, my return is imminent. And when it comes, it's going to be sudden. John's response ought to be the same response that we have tonight. And he responds by saying, Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. May it be so. Uh, let me close this in prayer. Father, thank you for reminding us over and over again that you're in charge, that your kingdom is still on target and on, on plan, and it, your son is coming back to reign as king of kings and lord of lords. Keep us from being discouraged. Instead, Lord, fill us with hope and give us the hope that we can share with others. Uh, motivate us to know your word and to proclaim it fearlessly in the time that we have. And we end as John ended, and we, we pray with all our heart, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We long for that day. We long for his appearing, and we long to be with you. We pray it all in his precious name. Amen.